This channel is part of the History Hit Network. They seem like ordinary men, articulate, educated, civilized, but they will turn into depraved, twisted monsters. They will commit acts of unimaginable cruelty for which they will feel no shame or remorse. Here is true evil. Heinrich Himmler, one of the most evil men in human history, begins as a mild-mannered bookish intellectual who loves tradition, country pursuits, and nature. He will become one of the most terrifying champions of the Third Reich, a monster even by Nazi standards. No name is more associated with Nazi atrocities than that of Himmler. Himmler will help to define Nazi ideology. More than most of the other Nazi leaders, Himmler is an ideologue, and he's really interested in ideas and systems of belief and creating a whole new culture, particularly for the SS. The transformation of Himmler into a Nazi monster is the story of the total collapse of morality and civilization in Germany. The story of Heinrich Himmler gives real insight into how Nazism evolved, how in 20 years a civilized European humanist country descends into such barbarism and darkness. Heinrich Himmler is as close as any human has ever been to true evil. In July 1942, Heinrich Himmler is inspecting Auschwitz-Birkenau. He is delighted, smiling in approval. It is everything he had hoped for, everything he had envisioned. In this camp alone, more than a million people will be murdered, most of them Jewish. But how did Himmler and the men around him come to the twisted conclusion that this human slaughter was the right thing to do? How could any human be capable of such monstrous cruelty? 20 years earlier, Nazism is virtually unheard of. And the man who will be one of its greatest heroes, Heinrich Himmler, is just taking his first steps towards moral oblivion. Heinrich Himmler is from a traditional, middle-class, conservative Catholic family. Himmler's strict parents bring up their children to respect the old rural German values of order, love of nature, community and tradition. Himmler comes from a deeply conservative background. He holds almost medieval views about the roles of women, about the roles of the people and about what Germany should be like. When Himmler goes to university, he studies agricultural science. As part of his course, he works on a farm in the small mountain town of Friedelfen. Agriculture is more than an economic activity to Himmler. It is an expression of a traditional German culture and life, which he fears is dying out. He goes hiking in the Bavarian mountains. He attends farming and craft shows and is an active member of the folk community. For Himmler, this is the ideal that he's been looking for. He's in communion with nature, the land, the German people that he's believed so much and read so much about. And it's here that he really gets interested in the idea of blood and soil. Blood and soil is the rallying cry of Germany's Volk or folk movement. They believe that communities are organic, People, like plants, grow out of the soil and belong to the land. Like plants and animals, people are the result of breeding and evolution. Blood and soil ideology is very important to Himmler and it becomes the foundation for his worldview, his politics. If you love history, then you will love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. 
History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. He embraces it fully. But in the 1920s, age-old rural German values are under threat from Germany's fast-expanding cities. To the dismay of the Volkists, German peasants who were once legally tied to the land are now free to move. They migrate in ever-increasing numbers to the cities in search of money, excitement and freedom. Rural conservatives like Himmler are appalled. In the cities, there is a corrupt mingling of sexes and classes and races. Cities pose a mortal threat to the traditional German values he holds dear. To Himmler, Weimar society is anathema. It encapsulates everything that he thinks is wrong with modern liberal democracy. He sees it as loose, as amoral, as everything that Germany shouldn't be. The cities are the product of capitalism. And for capitalism, the Vokists blame the Jews. For centuries, European Jews have been banned from owning land, forced to find other ways to make a living. So they tended to live in cities and to work in business. 80% of Germany's department stores were owned by Jews. To Himmler, the Jews represent everything that's wrong with Germany as he sees it under the Weimar Republic. They're linked to capitalism, they're linked to modernity, they're linked to all of the things that National Socialism will bring an end to. Himmler has to stop his postgraduate agricultural studies when his parents are unable to support him. In 1922, he is reduced to working as an assistant clerk in a fertilizer factory. He is poor, weedy, unattractive and bitter. His social life revolves around his parents and their friends. He's a very unprepossessing character. He's as far from a, a physical Aryan specimen as it's possible to get. In his young days, he had suffered constantly from ill health. But Himmler is about to find some meaning and direction in his life. He comes across a small new political party in Munich, which seems to echo his views. It is the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party. It opposes Jewish capitalism and promises to take Germany back to traditional values. An enthusiastic young Himmler signs up to its paramilitary organization, the SA, or Brown Shirts. He's nothing like most of the members of the SA who were tough guys, you know, they were street fighters. And he's nothing like that at all. I mean, he's, he's, he's the wimpy kid. He's lacking a sense of manliness, a sense of potency, a sense of effectiveness. And so by joining this organization, here he is, just papering over the cracks. He can pretend to be what he's never going to be in real life. Himmler may not be a tough guy, but he is clever and zealous, and graduates to Hitler's new personal protection squad, the SS. To begin with, the SS is just a small unit within the Brown Shirt Army. But when the ambitious Heinrich Himmler takes charge in 1929, he decides to build the SS into something bigger. When Himmler becomes active in the SS, it is a very small organization, only about 300 officers. It is not yet anywhere near the gigantic institution that it becomes later on. But Himmler is absolutely dedicated and he's given a large degree of autonomy to build this organization, which is answerable directly to uh, Adolf Hitler. Himmler starts to recruit more SS men, but in the early 1930s, it is still dwarfed in size and importance by the Brown Shirt SA, which has a staggering three million members. It was important for Hitler to have a private army, but it grew and it grew and it grew and it got away from him to the point where it was actually larger than the Wehrmacht, the actual German army. The SA Brown Shirt Army has its own politicians. It is funded directly by the state. 
The brown shirts are fiercely loyal to their leader, Ernst Röhm, who is Hitler's main rival in the Nazi movement. You have Ernst Röhm, he's the head of the SA, becoming more and more powerful in his own right. And Hitler wasn't going to have that. So, first of all, he speaks to Rome and he says, I can't have this happening, but Rome is above any kind of criticism at this point. And so Hitler takes matters to another level. For Himmler and Hitler, Rome represents everything they're not. He's very overweight, he, he's homosexual, he's seen as being very sybaritic, somewhat sort of loose and corrupt a figure. And so therefore they see the brown shirts and Rome as something that needs to be expunged, got rid of. A list of key SA leaders is drawn up. Himmler gets Hitler to invite them, along with Rome, to a high-level meeting at the town of Bad Wiese. With the brown shirt leadership in one place, they're sitting ducks. June 30th, 1934. At six in the morning, while the SA top brass are still in bed, Himmler's men storm their hotel. Some SA leaders are shot there and then. Many more, including Röhm, are arrested and later shot without trial. The night of the long night is a brutal purge. Hitler removes all opposition within the party. Heinrich Himmler is now free to build his own Nazi state security empire. With Ernst Röhm out of the way, Himmler is able to expand his power base. The Night of the Long Knives is where Himmler really wins his spurs as a Nazi. It's where he demonstrates to Hitler his absolute and blind loyalty. And as a result, he is rewarded almost immediately. Hitler allows Himmler to build up the SS. It will no longer be a small bodyguard unit. The SS takes charge of Nazi intelligence. And a new SS military wing is formed, the SS Verfugenstruppe. This will soon become known and reviled across Europe as the Waffen SS. Himmler wants the SS to be the greatest military machine on the planet, bar none. In order to bring this about, he decides to curate very carefully the kind of people that make it into this uh, elite fighting force. So he believes in kind of selection and he wants to take only the people who have the purest German blood. To choose and cultivate his SS supermen, Himmler will use the same techniques of plant and animal breeding he learned as a student. To join the SS, you had to meet very rigorous racial standards. Your background, your parentage. Himmler favored a certain physical appearance, the stereotypical tall, blonde hair, blue eyes. Himmler has a very specific and unique vision for the SS. This is not just going to be a police force or an army. For him, it transcends all of that. This is going to be the embodiment of the Herrenmensch. This is where the new Aryan race finds its champions. And to ensure the super breed continues and improves, Himmler issues his engagement and marriage order. It wasn't just the individuals who were making up the SS that Himmler carefully vetted, it was their wives as well. He had such control over their lives, he wouldn't let them marry anyone unless they conformed to certain standards. Like breeder animals, potential SS wives must meet standards of appearance and physical and mental health. Himmler even demands gynecological and other examinations to test for child-rearing potential. If the proposed wife is judged to be unlikely to be capable of rearing a child, she is sent for hormone treatment at the SS's expense. If the treatment proves successful, Himmler will approve the marriage. Himmler asserts puritanical control upon the SS. Himmler sees this as a revival of the Teutonic Knights, which was a sort of 12th century military order which came to represent the essence of Germanness. Good breeding was always the boast of Europe's aristocracy. They were bred to be naturally superior. It was in the blood. And it was this absurd genetic snobbery that inspired Nazi eugenics. 
Himmler and many SS officers were obsessed with, fascinated with the British aristocracy. For SS trainees, there was a whole etiquette manual that was modeled on how the British aristocracy deported itself, how they dressed, how they addressed each other, how one held a champagne glass properly to toast. Himmler is trying to build a new aristocracy. It's to be a very particular Germanic type, but it will be the new aristocracy of Germany. Like medieval knights, recruits to Himmler's SS pledge their allegiance on a sword. Himmler sees them as a new romantic order of Aryan warriors. He even gives the SS their own castle in Wevelsberg. Himmler imbues the castle at Wevelsberg with all sorts of imagery and symbolism of the great medieval German King Heinrich, because by then, Himmler has come to believe that he is the reincarnation of King Heinrich. You have these two sides to Himmler, and by extension, two sides to the SS. One is the brutal pragmatism of running this, this organization, and the other is a sort of quasi-religious mysticism that underpinned Himmler's beliefs and the SS. Himmler is after his own religion of Arianism. Under the Nazis, ancient pagan festivals are revived. Echoes of a primitive golden age, before the warlike German spirit was weakened by the soft, sentimental morality of Christians and Jews. The morality that we have, this liberal Judeo-Christian inflected morality, that is what's evil. That's what needs to be stamped out, because that is what prevents greatness. Himmler rejects Christianity and embraces New Age pagan mysticism. Himmler has a real passion for the occult. He's into the mumbo-jumbo, he's into the astrology, he, he's into all these old legends and myths. He's into various artifacts that he thinks will literally bring power. In 1935, Himmler sets up a group within the SS called the Arnenerbe. The Arnenerbe will spend millions sending people around the world trying to prop up Himmler's cod beliefs. He sends teams off to Tibet to discover whether Tibet was once a German colony. There are people investigating whether the Buddha was in fact German. One of Himmler's lead gurus and inspirations in the Arnenerbe is a man called Willigut, who is an insane lunatic obsessed with this German prehistory. And Himmler first meets him at a conference on Nordic questions and Nordic history. But he brings him into the Arnenerbe and promotes him to become its most recognizable figure. Billigut says he is descended from Aryan priest kings. He says the German race goes back to 230,000 years BC, when giants roamed the earth and there were three suns in the sky. Unfortunately for Himmler, it becomes widely known that Willigut had spent some time in a mental asylum where he'd been sectioned. So, reluctantly, Himmler has to let him go. It's all nonsense. It's all crap, fundamentally. It's just crap. And the one person who thinks it's crap, actually, is Hitler. Hitler delivers a speech denouncing occultism as a distraction. Himmler is told he has serious work to do. Hitler intends to purge Germany and Europe of Jews. And to do it will be the job of Himmler and his SS. Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, sees his power grow still further when in 1934 he takes charge of the German secret police, the Geheime Staatspolizei, known across Germany as the Gestapo. The Gestapo is declared above the law, unaccountable to the courts, a perfect instrument of state terror. When we look at the Gestapo, it tells us a lot about the relationship between the German public and the Nazi regime. The Gestapo was always a relatively small organization in terms of the number of its personnel. After the war, many Germans 
wanted the world to believe that they lived in constant terror of arrest and harassment and interrogation and imprisonment by the Gestapo. The truth is that the vast majority of non-Jewish Germans never met a Gestapo officer. They never had any contact with the Gestapo. The Gestapo also benefited from the fact that a considerable number of Germans were willing to inform on each other, to denounce each other to the Gestapo. And I think political loyalty explains why Germans inform on each other. By the late 1930s, Himmler is the most powerful man in the Nazi state machine, second only to Hitler. Himmler has risen to extraordinary heights. He's now the head of the Gestapo, he's the head of the police, he's the head of the SS, and he's the head of the SD. He's almost made himself bulletproof. But Himmler does not seek power for its own sake. He wants to use it to turn back the clock to restore Germany to its idyllic pre-capitalist past of happy, smiling peasants working the land. Himmler and the Nazi Vokists are nature lovers. They send soldiers into the countryside to plant trees and establish nature reserves. The Nazis promote vegetarianism and herbal remedies and pass laws to protect animals. Himmler's SS even has its own supply of organic food. Himmler wants to bring Germany's corrupted urban masses back to the countryside. To do this, in 1931, he opens the SS Race and Resettlement Office. To run it, he appoints Richard Walter Dare. Richard Dare was an important ideologue who came to be very close to Himmler, and he believed in the blood and soil ideology. More than anything, he believed in racial segregation, wanted to forge together a body of people who were racially pure, and he believed that would make them stronger. Urban workers are urged to return to the land with the offer of free plots. Existing small farmers are forbidden from selling land, effectively tying them once more to the soil. But Germany's population has swelled in recent decades. To resettle them, the Nazis will need more land. They call it living space or Lebensraum, and they will get it by taking Poland. Their ultimate goal is to expand into Poland, transform Poland into living space for the German race. So what does that mean for the Polish population? The Nazis' objective is to destroy Poland, to destroy the Polish state, Polish culture. From an ideological perspective, one of the key missions for Himmler was around the Volksdeutsche, the German people, the race of German people who were spread over Europe. And he wants to see them all reunited. They have to be brought together into a greater Reich. Key to this plan for the Volksdeutsche is to resettle them. So all of the lands that have been cleared to the east, the former Slavic lands, are going to be handed over and dedicated to this new vast world of the Volksdeutsche, the German people. Genocide in Eastern Europe will create space for Himmler's rural utopia. To get the ball rolling, Himmler offers half a million Germans a fresh start in the newly conquered territories. The Race and Resettlement Office checks their backgrounds and grants them land. Land taken from the genetically inferior Polish population. But this presents a eugenics dilemma. Over the years, many Poles and Germans have interbred. Himmler wants to spare any Aryans living in Poland. If you were deemed to be of you know, Aryan pedigree or look like you were, they would measure the gap between the eyes and the size of the skull. One of the most diabolical things the SS does is if a Polish family had children that fit the racial stereotype, those children would be taken from that family and they would be given uh, as a form of adoption to German settler families moving into Poland. Around 200,000 Polish children are declared to be Aryan by the Nazis, taken from their parents and sent for re-Germanization. 
As for the children who didn't conform to those features, they were often sterilised. While a few Polish Aryans are spared, Slavic Poles, and in particular, Jewish Poles, are not. Himmler is now fulfilling his lifelong ambitions of uniting the German people. And he's also weeding out the toxic elements of the lesser races and the lesser cultures. The fact is, Heinrich Himmler has terrifying plans to, to change the, the racial landscape of Europe. It is with Nazi ethnic cleansing in Poland that the story of the Holocaust begins. The Jewish race is to be exterminated, says every party member. That's clear, it's part of our program. Elimination of the Jews, extermination, right, we'll do it. This was the final solution, and it was to be carried out by Hitler's most trusted men, the SS. The elimination of Europe's Jews starts in Germany. To begin with, Jews have their assets confiscated, and some are forced to seek refuge in other countries. Himmler's policy of deportation is brutal. Long-standing members of the community are uprooted and forced to flee. These people are refugees, but ultimately, they are the lucky ones. What happens next is seen in this disturbing footage. Himmler's SS men begin dragging Jews out of their homes, beating them, stripping them, and herding them into ghettos. When the ghettos become too crowded and difficult to control, they're sent to newly built concentration camps. Dachau is the first concentration camp in Nazi Germany. It's distinct from a prison. It's a place where you send enemies of the state, enemies of your party. These aren't crimes in traditional terms, but they are crimes in the Nazi state. Jews, opponents of the Nazis and others, are rounded up and locked away. It's a place where the Nazi party puts its Jews, its communists, uh, its homosexuals, its gypsies. People that aren't the right sort of people in the Nazi mindset. The regime makes the existence of concentration camps known to the public. This is deliberate. The idea here is to publicize the existence of the camps as a warning, as an unspoken, indirect warning to the public. The SS builds the first camps, and the SS becomes the administrator of what becomes a vast system of ultimately some 20,000 camps in Germany and in German-controlled Europe. For Himmler, the camps serve another important function, to realize his dream of genetic and racial cleansing. Natural selection suggests that genetically inferior strains should die out. Himmler, the plant breeding scientist, will apply a twisted version of this logic to the human race. Dachau becomes a place not just of incarceration, but also a place of horror, because within days, Jewish prisoners start dying. Public prosecutors had demanded an explanation for these deaths, but Himmler has established his own SS courts. The SS will be judge, jury, and executioner free to kill as they see fit. Heinrich Himmler's plans to eradicate undesirables from the growing German Empire will need a new kind of military unit. And so he creates a special SS task force, the Einsatzgruppen. The job of the Einsatzgruppen was brutally simple. It was to murder people. Let's not put any finer point on it than that. The Einsatzgruppen follows the German army as it pushes east. The first important element of the final solution is the Einsatzgruppen, is the mobile execution squads that follow the regular German army, first into Poland and then into the Soviet Union. These are SS units, and their job is to murder Jews, but also Soviet political officers, Soviet citizens, Roma people, the mentally and physically handicapped are another target. The man Himmler puts in charge of his Einsatzgruppen death squads is Reinhard Heydrich. 
Hitler himself refers to Heydrich as the man with the iron heart, and he's pretty widely considered to be the cruelest and the most brutal of all the high-ranking Nazi officers. Heydrich is the son of a classical composer and music teacher. He is no mindless thug, nor are the officers in his Einsatzgruppen. They are doctors and lawyers and teachers. Half of the Einsatzgruppen's senior officers have postgraduate degrees. They are respected figures of authority, and their job is to persuade and reassure ordinary troops that mass murder is scientifically and morally justified. Though Christianity holds that human life is sacred, according to Nazi environmentalism, humans are no more important than plants and animals. Himmler's victims are just diseased nature. The Jews are weeds. They must be ripped out and destroyed. These brutal, unspeakable acts are actually the logical conclusion to his way of thinking. This is what justifies his actions, and it's thought out, and it's planned, and it's systematic. At the start of the killing, a Nazi lawyer, Bruno Muller, shows his soldiers what they must do. He singles out a woman and her child, takes his gun, and shoots them both dead. Within just three days, his Einsatzgruppen unit will shoot 24,000 Jewish men, women, children, and babies. What's remarkable about the Einsatzgruppen is just quite how small they actually are. In total, over the entire course of the war, no more than 3,000 men will be employed in the Einsatzgruppen, and yet they murder nearly two million people. They are responsible for the first major killing stage of the final solution. And some historians now refer to this phase of the Holocaust as the Holocaust by bullets. In 1941, Himmler visits Minsk to witness one of the many Einsatzgruppen massacres. The soldiers have developed their preferred killing techniques. Victims are forced to kneel or stand over a mass grave. This saves the bother of handling them. Himmler has never seen a dead body before and almost faints. What's worse, the scale of the killing seems to be affecting his men. Himmler goes to inspect the bloody activities of the Einstadtgruppen, and um, he clocks quite early on that there's a bit of a problem. Despite the reassurances of their officers that what they're doing is scientific, the troops are beginning to crack. One of the problems for the SS is that the mobile execution squad's killing of hundreds of thousands of people begins to take a significant psychological toll on the executioners. The soldiers are marching into villages, slaughtering everyone, men, women, and children. The relentless murder, the total barbarism, is beginning to send them mad. So horrific were the scenes that they encountered pretty much on a daily basis uh, that they begin to turn to alcohol abuse, they begin to become depressed, the suicide rate uh, is very, very high. So these um, brutal killers are beginning to buckle under the weight of the work that Himmler is expecting them to do. Himmler realises that a new form of mass murder must be devised, something more efficient, more clinical something that will, to some degree, shield the murderers themselves from the full realisation of what they're doing. If the whole thing was institutionalised and it was done in a more impersonal way, then people are going to be absolved of the blame. So the conclusion Himmler reaches is that uh, the whole thing has to be mechanised. The Nazis are already using carbon monoxide from car exhaust tailpipes to gas groups of people. This method of killing will now be taken to the next level. The Nazis turned to the German chemicals industry, who were pioneers in the manufacture of poison gas in World War I. And Himmler devises a plan that will culminate in the most brutal and horrific slaughter in human history. On October the 13th, 1941, Heinrich Himmler gives the orders for the construction of Belzec, the first of several purpose-built extermination camps. He then decrees that the Jewish populations of Eastern Europe should be rounded up, loaded onto trains, and sent to the death camps. 
the Jews of Western Europe will be next. There was one particular camp that Himmler had his eye on. It was one of the largest camps. It already had an IG Farben factory there. And in 1942, he turned it into something far, far greater, something that everybody knows the name of now, and that was Auschwitz. The full horror of what happened in the death camps only becomes known to the world when Allied soldiers enter them in the closing weeks of the war. What they find is carefully recorded. Their films contain the most disturbing images ever captured on camera. Death is everywhere. The living dead. At first, they were not known to be alive among the corpses with whom they lay in indescribable filth. Some will not live more than a few hours. All were once men of dignity and courage. The cameras go inside the gas chambers. The plaster on the walls bears the imprints of hands, the hands of those about to die, clawing hopelessly, trying to escape the gas. They film abandoned crematoria where the SS tried to destroy the evidence of their barbarism. In Auschwitz-Birkenau, Himmler demands not one, but eight giant gas chambers and 46 ovens. His SS guards work around the clock, murdering their Jewish prisoners. The rate of murder is incredible. In each chamber, 2,000 people can be murdered every 90 minutes. The victims know what is coming, or else they sense it. Children cry out. Their mothers hold them tight as the gas enters the chambers. When you start reciting the numbers killed in the Holocaust, it's almost meaningless. You have to really stop and think about it. And the numbers of people killed just in Auschwitz-Birkenau were 1.3 million people in this one place. And of those, 1.1 million of them were Jewish. There's no doubt Heinrich Himmler was the chief architect of the Holocaust. He was the man who put the most thought into how people could be killed on a massive industrial scale. He was the person with the responsibility. He was the person with the obscene imagination who was able to carry it out. In July 1942, Himmler is given a tour of Auschwitz, his flagship camp. He is given a demonstration of the newly installed gas chambers. Himmler is delighted with the work of his SS men. Later at the Nuremberg trials, a Nazi orderly describes his daily work. It took from three to 15 minutes to kill the people in the death chamber, depending upon climatic conditions. We knew when the people were dead because their screaming stopped. After the bodies were removed, our special commandos took off the rings and extracted the gold from the teeth of the corpses. Gold worth millions of dollars is plundered from the bodies. The Nazis hoard the clothing and possessions of their victims. Their hair is used to weave socks for soldiers on the front. Tattooed skin is removed to make lampshades. Around six million Jews, millions of Russian prisoners of war, millions of Polish people and Serbs, and countless hundreds of thousands of disabled people, gypsies and others, are killed. It's very, very difficult to estimate exactly how many people were killed in the Holocaust. We'll never know a precise figure, but something like 11 million people were killed. The death camps are the ultimate expression of Himmler's twisted ideas. 
his crackpot mysticism, his hatred, his racism, his eulogizing of the German people. It's all concentrated into the death camps and they are the ultimate expression of his vision. But just as Himmler is sending millions to their death in the camps, the tide of war is turning. By 1943, the Nazis are running out of everything. Manpower, food, supplies. And ironically, it is the barbaric actions of Himmler that ensure the Nazis will lose. On Himmler's orders, vast resources which might have been used to fight the war are being used instead to murder Jews and others. It is Himmler who murders in their millions the very farmers and workers in Eastern Europe who might have fed and sustained the Nazi war machine. It is Himmler's SS who butcher innocent Russian people who might otherwise have risen up against their own communist oppressors. It is Himmler and his men committing the most shocking acts of inhumanity who ensure that every decent country in the world turns against them. In the end, it is these very acts of calculated savagery that will cost the Nazis the war and Himmler his life. By the end of 1944, seven million Russian troops are heading towards Germany's eastern border. The American and British armies are closing in from the west. As the Allies advance, Himmler considers how his eugenics program is likely to be seen by the rest of the world. They won't understand his higher moral justification. They won't listen to Himmler's scientific arguments about nature and evolution. They will just see the mountains upon mountains of bodies. It's pretty obvious uh, to Himmler that the game is up, all is lost, but he has trouble accepting his fate. He has trouble with the idea that he's just going to go down as a mass murderer and be imprisoned and possibly executed. So he begins to see all the prisoners, or the, sort of the Jewish people in the uh, concentration camps, as bargaining chips. And one of the bargains was to say that I will release all the prisoners from my concentration camps, trying to make himself look sort of munificent and grand. But no Allied government wants to be seen making sordid bargains with the Nazis. Now, Himmler panics. He orders his SS to stop killing Jews. The concentration camps will be evacuated. To save his own skin, Himmler will stop the Holocaust. He orders the release of around 1,000 Jews who are sent by train to Switzerland and handed over to the Red Cross. Himmler meets with a member of the World Jewish Congress and says he wants to make peace with the Jews, claiming that Auschwitz is merely a crematorium, disposing of the bodies of people who died of typhus. Himmler's attempts to present himself as a humanitarian at the end of the war beggar belief. Did he really think the Allies would fall for this? Himmler realizes that the writing is on the wall, that Germany probably isn't going to win the war, but what she might be able to do is to not lose it, um, and that Germany could indeed maybe have some sort of arrangement with the Allies uh, that she won't be conquered. With the Allied forces making advances on all fronts, Himmler asks the Swiss government to approach the Allies on his behalf in the vain hope of making a deal. But Himmler's sinful, disgusting crimes are about to catch up with him. As Himmler is trying to make these deals with the Allies, Auschwitz, of course, has been liberated by the Russians, and the worldwide media has been reporting the slaughter that went on there. So no one's under any illusions by this stage that Himmler is anything other than an evil butcher. When Himmler realizes that this supposed act of mercy is just a total waste of time, he then gets incredibly vengeful and shows his true murderousness. He orders prisoners in Dachau, Flossenburg, all to be summarily executed. 
this just shows the sort of awful, vindictive, evil, small-mindedness of the man, that if he can't get his own way, he'll just kill everybody he can. It's like a child knocking over his sandcastle on the beach at the end of the day, but doing that with a human life, and, and many human lives. Nelson, where the victims of the Crooked Cross died in their tens of thousands. Grim pictures. Now we can see the incontestable truth. Nelson had been guarded by SS men and SS women. Our most unpleasant task has been making the SS, of which there are about 50, bury the dead. Up to press, we have buried about 17,000 people. As Himmler's crimes are revealed to the world, News of his failed attempt to strike a deal with the Allies reaches Hitler. When Hitler learns what Himmler's done, he, first of all, strips him of all his titles, and he's got a lot of titles. He then calls him a traitor to his country and a traitor to him. And, of course, for Himmler, this isn't just a job. This is everything he is, everything he stands for. It's his religion, it's his life, it's his identity, and it's shattered. Rejected by Hitler, exposed as the butcher of millions of innocent people, and with the Allies closing in, Himmler now flees. He disguises himself as an ordinary soldier, adopting the name Sergeant Heinrich Hitzinger. Days later, Sergeant Hitzinger is captured by a unit of British soldiers. But the face of Heinrich Himmler is too well known and he is quickly exposed. With the world watching, Himmler is taken by British troops for interrogation in Lüneburg. But concealed in his uniform is a cyanide capsule. Before he can be questioned, Himmler bites on the vial, and within minutes, he is dead. An ignominious end to the most evil life recorded in history. It's a pity for the world that somebody didn't do it for him when he was born. His body is dumped nearby in an unmarked grave. Himmler, the champion of organic farming and herbal medicine. Himmler, who promotes handicrafts and New Age mysticism. Himmler, who values nature more highly than humanity. Himmler, the radical environmentalist, who finds in science a rational justification for mass murder. As close as any human has ever come to being truly evil. <laughs>